Hello, and welcome to another episode of Saints and Sinners. My name is Derek Atkins, and during the past two months, we have been going on a journey through the book of 2 Chronicles. But today, we are going to do something a little different. This week is Holy Week, and on Friday, we celebrated Good Friday, the day when Jesus died on the cross. And so today, we are going to look at a passage about Jesus' death. Um, today's passage is from the, chap the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke was written by the Apostle Luke, who was a doctor by training. At the beginning of his Gospel, Luke tells us that he wrote this Gospel to provide the world with an orderly account of Jesus' life and ministry. In Luke 1.3, Luke reports that he carefully investigated the events of Jesus' life. And this tells us that this passage that we are going to be reading today about Jesus' death on the cross was part of Luke's careful investigation of the life of the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, throughout his gospel, Luke records Jesus' ministry, including his miracles and his teaching. As Jesus' ministry progressed, he encountered increasing opposition from Israel's religious leaders until a plot was hatched to have Jesus arrested. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and led a detachment of Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus. After being tried by a Jewish court and questioned by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, Jesus was sentenced to death on a cross. Today's passage begins with Jesus' arrival at Golgotha. So this is from Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do, do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our de deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. And this ends the passage that we're looking at for today, which ends in verse 43 of Luke chapter 23. So, now that we've read this passage, let's see what God wants us to um, take away from this passage. 
in verses 32 and 33, we read that Jesus was crucified between two criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Now, let me say a few things about crucifixion. Crucifixion was probably the cruelest form of execution the Roman had. In fact, it was considered to be so cruel that it was forbidden for a Roman citizen to be crucified. This is why the Apostle Paul, when it came time for him to be executed, he was not crucified. Rather, he was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen and could not be executed by crucifixion. In crucifixion, iron spikes about five to seven inches long, that would be 13 to 18 centimeters long, were driven through the condemned hand, uh, wrists and ankles. The condemned was then lifted up on a cross and left to hang on the cross. Death was a slow and agonizing affair, oft, sometimes taking as long as three days. Now, medical experts tell us that there are several possible causes of death in crucifixion, but the most common cause of death was asphyxiation. For you see, when a criminal, when a condemned person is hanging on a cross, Breathing becomes extremely difficult and extremely painful because they have to push themselves up every time they draw in a breath. And that causes a great deal of pain because of the way their arms and legs are positioned. And it takes great effort to draw in each breath. And so what happens is, um, so this the, the condemned will struggle every moment to take in another breath and after a while the condemned will eventually give up trying uh, going to all that effort to breathe and when they give up trying to breathe they quickly die from asphyxiation now death would take anywhere from three hours to three days depending on what kind of crucifixion was being done and how strong the condemned body was. Not only was crucifixion painful, it was also humiliating because those who were crucified were crucified completely naked in a public place. Now, you may have seen pictures and paintings of Jesus' crucifixion and in these pictures, you always see Jesus wearing some kind of loincloth. But that is actually inaccurate. Because when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified completely naked in a public place. And the, the reason for this was because crucifixion was not only meant to be excruciatingly painful, from which we get the word excruciating, which means out of the cross, but it was also meant to be humiliating. And it was considered a shameful way to die. And this is why the New Testament speaks of the shame of the cross. The Romans used crucifixion to punish all kinds of crimes but especially the crimes of piracy and rebellion. The Romans used crucifixion as a warning to others to not commit crimes. And um, for our Chinese um, neighbors, the, the appropriate proverb that would go with this, with a crucifixion would be the proverb kill the rooster, scare the monkey. In other words, crucifixions were carried out to warn people and to frighten people into obeying the law. And so this is 
was the purpose behind crucifixion. Now, Jesus was crucified between two criminals. The Bible does not tell us what their crimes were, but it does tell us that they were criminals. Now, in verses 34 and 35, we see a big contrast between the attitudes of Jesus and those who gathered to watch his death. We read that the ruler sneered at him and mocked him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the Son of God. I mean, the chosen one. These words show us a couple of really significant things. First, they show us that the people of Jerusalem were very aware of the claim that Jesus was the promised Messiah. The Old Testament is filled with many prophecies about a promised deliverer, the Messiah. And Jews in Jesus' day were waiting for that promised deliverer. However, Jesus was not the only person who claimed to be the promised Messiah. There were others in his day who also claimed to be the chosen one who would deliver Israel from her enemies. And some of these people who claimed to be Messiah, the Messiah led armed revolts against the Roman rule. However, none of those who claimed to be Messiah succeeded. And perhaps this was one reason why people in this crowd mocked Jesus with these words. The other thing I want to point out about these words is that this crowd treated Jesus with contempt. Hours earlier, a similar crowd had viciously cried, cried out for Jesus' crucifixion, calling, crucify, crucify, again and again. Jesus encountered much opposition during his ministry, and many people were opposed to him then, and many people are still opposed to him today. They enjoy mocking Jesus, mocking the Bible, mocking traditional Christian beliefs, and mocking those who follow Jesus. And yet, Jesus refused to respond to this hostility with hatred. Instead of returning evil for evil, he responded to evil by speaking words of forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. These are remarkable words because they demonstrate Jesus' heart and Jesus' attitude towards those who were directly responsible for his crucifixion. The religious leaders hatched a plot to have Jesus executed. They cut a deal with Judas Iscariot and gave him 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. They carried out a mockery of a court trial. They stirred up the crowd to demand Jesus' death. And while Jesus hung on the cross, they mocked him to his face. And Jesus forgave them of all of this. Did they deserve forgiveness? Of course not. But Jesus still forgave them. He forgave them because of love. Now, this is not a grandfatherly kind of love that indulgently winks at wrongdoing. Now, I'm not knocking the love that grandparents have for their grandchildren because that is a wonderful and loving expression of their care and devotion for their grandchildren. But what I am saying is that Jesus' love is much different from a grand, the kind of love that a grandparent has for their grandchildren. 
Rather, Jesus' love is more like that of a father. When a child misbehaves, a father doesn't simply shrug his shoulder and excuse wrongdoing. Instead, he punishes his child because he wants what is truly best for his child. That is, he wants his child to become a person of good character. And he knows that the way to teach that child to become a good person of good character is to punish them appropriately so that the child will learn the difference between right and wrong behavior. But at the same time, a father will also forgive his child of wrongdoing because his, he loves his child with an undying, unfailing love. In verses 36 and 37, the soldiers who were at Golgotha also mocked Jesus, but not just with words. You see, part of the horror of crucifixion was the agony of thirst that it caused in those being crucified, so that they were incredibly thirsty. And so these soldiers mocked Jesus by offering him vinegar. These soldiers seem to have offered Jesus something drink to quench his terrible thirst, only to quickly snatch it away. And so this was another form of mockery. As if being mocked by the crowd, being mocked by the religious leaders, and being mocked by soldiers wasn't enough, Jesus was also mocked by one of the criminals who was hanged with him. Verse 39 tells us that one of the criminals who was also being crucified hurled insults at Jesus, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. He, too, was aware of the claim that Jesus was the promised Messiah, and yet he, too, like so many others on that awful day, dismissed the idea that Jesus was the chosen one. But the other criminal had a much different attitude toward Jesus. In verses 40 and 41, he rebuked the other criminal saying, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. These are remarkable words. This criminal confessed that he was a sinner and that he was being punished justly for his crimes. He also confessed that Jesus had done no wrong, that Jesus was in fact completely innocent. The second criminal then spoke to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here, this criminal recognized Jesus as the Messiah, God's chosen one. We have no way to know how much this criminal really understood about who Jesus was, but he seems to have had enough saving knowledge to cry out to Jesus for salvation because in verse 43, Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. With this simple sentence, Jesus washed away all of the criminal's sin and assured him that he would soon be in heaven with Jesus forever. Not only that, 
but we see that Jesus' gift of eternal life to this criminal was pure grace because this criminal had no time to do any acts of repentance or devotion. He was literally dying, and he literally had one foot in the grave. And he would soon be gone from the land of the living. My friend, none of us deserves God's gift of eternal life. All of us have sinned, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have no, done what we know is wrong. All of us know what right and wrong is. And all of us, at one time or another, have chosen to do that which we know is wrong. In other words, there is no excuse for any of us. And yet, Jesus was willing to go to the cross to bear the shame and humiliation of dying on the cross and to bear the mockery of those who hated him. He was willing to endure all of this as well as the full wrath of a holy God bearing all of our sins upon himself so that we can be forgiven of all the wrongs we have ever done and have everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ. John 3.16 explains this very clearly. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So, what is your response to Jesus' death? Today, it is becoming more and more popular to mock Jesus, to mock the teachings of the Bible, and to mock God. Will you join them in mocking Jesus? Or will you turn to Jesus and accept his offer? of eternal life. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So I urge you to choose the path of life and to believe in Jesus, to believe in his death and resurrection. I urge you to accept Jesus' gift of eternal life, which is pure grace, because none of us deserve it one single bit, for we are all sinners before God. So won't you give your heart to Jesus today? If you want to give your heart to Jesus now and receive his gift of eternal life today, then you can pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that that I have done wrong, that I have done what I know is wrong, and I have sinned against you and against my fellow man. I confess that you are right in judging me to be a sinner. And I ask, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. I ask for your forgiveness of all of my sins. And I ask, Lord, I, I, I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I ask you to come into my life 
and to be my master and my king. And I pledge to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you pray that prayer, I want to be the first to welcome you into the family of God. You now have brothers and sisters all over the world who also follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I also want to urge you to do a couple of things. First, I want to encourage you to find a Bible-believing church to be a part of. While he was on earth, Jesus established the church as a community of believers, a family of faith, so that we can encourage and support one another in our walk with Jesus Christ. Being part of a Bible-believing church is a vital part of your Christian growth. Second, I want to encourage you to spend time with Jesus each day. Find a Bible, read a little bit of it each day, and spend time in prayer talking to Jesus. And if you do these things each day, you will grow in your relationship with Jesus, and Jesus will begin to do an amazing work in your life. And so this is why Jesus died for us on the cross, so that we can have eternal life. And this is why we are able to call that Friday Good Friday. It was not good for Jesus because he died an agonizing death, but it was good for us because we, because apart from Jesus, we have no way to have eternal life. So I hope you enjoyed today's special Saints and Sinners video. And I invite you to join me next time as we return to our study of the book of Second Chronicles in the Old Testament. God bless you, and have a blessed Easter.